Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. Well, good morning, church family. Turn with me, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, as we begin in verse 45, as we continue our walk through our sermon series titled, The Cross Has Spoken. We've been looking at the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Now, I'll tell you guys up front, uh, every Sunday as I crawl into the pulpit, there is a healthy dose of uh, fear and trepidation to stand and to preach God's word. This morning is double, triple, quadruple, whatever you would take. I will say up front, right, uh, my inability to articulate the magnitude of what Jesus endured on the cross this morning. Words fail. So let me plead up front for us to pray, right? There, there is no room for distant intellectualizing. We must invite the, the raw horror of the cross to assault us. Otherwise, there, there is no healing for our souls. It was the night of the Last Supper, and Jesus looked at his disciples with a depth of compassion and love for them. He knew they did not understand what was about to take place. Luke tells us that he entered the upper room with joy. He looked at them and said, I, I have been waiting to have this supper with you. In John, we are told that Jesus washed his disciples' feet and then took an extensive amount of time to proclaim to them the promises of comfort that the Holy Spirit would come. A comforter will come. As they leave the upper room and walk across Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, Jesus' countenance noticeably changes. When he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, he declares to his disciples, my soul has become troubled, overwhelmed to the point of death. He asked them to pray for him but they are incapable of completing the task and they fall asleep. He will spend the next three hours alone in the garden praying. The weight of what is to come drops him to his knees. He is sweating profusely, his heart pounding as the burden grows. His sweat turns into blood. And on his knees, he cries, Abba, Father. An intimate plea from son to his father, Abba. All things are possible for you if there is any other way. If there is any other way besides this cup. Hold on to this moment because today when we hear Jesus cry from the cross, he is crying in regards to this cup. Not my will, but yours be done. Three times, apparently for an hour each, 
the son goes to his Abba father and pleads. Is there any other way? It is the reason he came. But in the moment, he must fight for faith. He must fight for resolve. And in the silence of the father, the son is assured that there is no other way. (coughs) So without resistance, Jesus now marches towards the cup that awaits him. Willingly, he goes. No more pleas because he trusts that this is the Father's will. You see, Adam shamefully hid in the garden, but Jesus boldly presents himself. And as a sheep that is led, that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. Matthew repeatedly reminds us that he is the silent lamb of God. Without self-defense, explanation, or justification. He is silent before the Sanhedrin as they search for any accusation that might stick. He is silent before Pilate as the charges are brought. He did not utter a single word before Herod. Pilate will actually cry out in his place. Why? What evil has he done? But the Lamb of God remains silent. Have you ever wondered why, beloved? Because he stands in the silence of the condemned. And he is moving with resolve to drink the cup that awaits him. Jesus' silence compels us to pause and to examine each and every word that was spoken. That, That he would break that silence intentionally. And that is what we have been doing all along, combing through the last words of the cross. And this morning, friend, we have come to the cup. So listen as I read Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, this morning, we do confess to you that words fall short that our heart's own ability to understand your holiness is so limited. That our heart's ability to understand the gravity of love that you have towards us is completely limited. We cry right now that you would send your Holy Spirit that you would allow us to see, that you would illuminate the eyes of our heart to see and to behold the magnificence of your cross. That you have revealed yourself, that that you have rendered the heavens, that you have come down, that that you have told your story, your unfolding story, such as to reveal your heart, such as to highlight and to expose your holiness and your love in the atonement on the cross. And Father, we are desperate to understand more, more fully to grasp just a hint of the magnificence of who you are and all that you have accomplished on our behalf. Father, to understand that this love changes us. This love is our only hope. That knowing this love is to have eternal life. 
And so I pray if there's anyone here this morning under the sound of my voice that does not know you, that today is the day of salvation. And those of us that do know you, Father, please reveal more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You see, it was common for crucified criminals to (coughs) shout in pain or anger from the cross, to yell curses to anyone within earshot. But as we have noted, Jesus is the opposite. He is noticeably silent. He was crucified at 9 (coughs) a.m., And for the first three hours, he has only spoken three times of note. The time reaches noon, when the sun is directly overhead, when, it, when light is the brightest, when suddenly darkness covers the land. Did you know it was impossible for a solar eclipse to occur at the time of the Passover. Because the Passover, okay, is always in a full moon season. No, this was a supernatural sign of judgment. Presumably uh, covering the entire land of Israel. Like the ninth plague of darkness over Egypt. Signaling God's judgment. So too here, Matthew and Mark include the event as a symbol of the potent wrath of God. Now there are a few Old Testament passages of note, but none more compelling than Amos chapter 8 verses 9 and 10. Listen to this. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon. And make the earth dark in broad daylight. And then I will turn your festivals into mourning. And I will make it a time of mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. You see, as we've been walking through the scene of mocking and hurling abuse has now transitioned to one of ire and darkness as Jesus now hangs for three hours under the cloud of judgment. Up to this point, Jesus has been forsaken by group after group. He has been forsaken by the Jewish leaders who who found the man and then they searched for the charge and accusation that they could put against him, such as to get rid of him. He has been forsaken by his government, by Pilate, who admitted that, that, that there was no basis for the charges against him, but would crucify him anyways. He has been forsaken by the crowd, the same crowd that heralded his his entrance into Jerusalem just days prior in the triumphal entry, but has now been convinced that they can prove that he is or is not the Messiah by putting him to test, forcing him to miraculously come down from the cross and save himself because cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. He has even been forsaken by his own disciples. Judas, who betrayed him. The others who have scattered into hiding because of fear. And Peter denied ever knowing him. No one wants to die alone. Does it surprise you that one so good should be left so forsaken? But here we find that Jesus was forsaken by God himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now before we go any further, there is a need this morning for me to put some guardrails into place in order to speak accurately and yet into the mystery, we need boundaries 
on either side. So do not label me a heretic or misunderstand what I'm saying. One guardrail. Theologians are clear to maintain that we are not talking about an ontological break in the Trinity. So in the same way that you would not say Jesus' divine nature died, likewise, there is an ontological union within the Trinity that it is not appropriate to say that that union was broken, for how could it be? So whatever is meant here by forsaken must be within the boundaries of that. And admittedly, let's say it up front, we are entering into mystery because the gospel writers do not give us precise details here. But this is what I will say. Just as in the incarnation is a mystery, right? How could God become man? And yet, in eternity past, as God planned and then made man in his image, God knew that the in his image part, that it had to include the possibility of the incarnation. So too here, in eternity past, the Godhead knew what redemption would cost God knew the cross and the necessity of the forsaking. The Father and the Holy Spirit knew the forsaking of the Son and its compatibility with the Trinity. On the other side, the other guardrail, there are well-meaning Christians, because of the complexity of what I just described, who tried to sweep away Jesus' statement here on the cross. They say Jesus was not forsaken. He was quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Okay, remember last week how Chad introduced us and we looked at Psalm 22. Well, that is correct, right? That is being quoted here by Jesus. And they say at the beginning of the psalm, David uh, is crying out that he is forsaken. But by the time you get to the end of the psalm, the psalm has turned into joyful thanksgiving because he is delivered. So he's actually not forsaken, and Jesus is referencing the entire psalm. That's the argument. In other words, Jesus is simply crying out, Psalm 22, it looks like I'm forsaken, but I'm not. Now, the chief difficulty with this is that it makes void the very words coming out of Jesus' mouth. It actually pretends the opposite. Jesus says he's forsaken, but he means he's not forsaken. Beloved, Jesus doesn't cry, Psalm 22, from the cross. He cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, that's like saying, remember last week when Jesus said, I am thirsty. Well, that's a direct fulfillment of Psalm 69. But would we say, Jesus wasn't really thirsty, he was just quoting Psalm 69. Or coming up in two weeks, into your hands I commit my spirit. Again, a direct quotation of Psalm 31 verse 5. Are we to say Jesus didn't mean those words, he was just referencing a psalm? I would tell you no, it is better to take the words at face value. That Jesus is conscious of being forsaken by his father. You know, God doesn't need rescuing from the scandalous nature of the cross. It was his idea from the foundation of the world. Acts chapter two, verse 23 says, godless and evil men nailed him to the cross according to the foreknowledge and predetermined plan of God. So with those guardrails in place, we are invited 
to wade out into the water of the greatest act of love in all history. Come consider the price that he paid for you. My God, my God. This is a unique utterance for Jesus who radically addressed God as Father, taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, and just hours before had cried out in the garden, Abba, Father. But now the address is, My God. Jesus still trusts, he still has faith, but the nearness of Father is no longer present. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken means abandon, to leave, to desert. At the end of Paul's life, in his final letter, He mentions that aside from Luke, all others had deserted him, left him to die alone. Hebrews 10, 25 tells us as a congregation, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. To forsake means to break fellowship, to abandon nearness. You say, oh, the depths that Adam did fall when he sinned in the garden. And hiding in shame, he was separated from God. But even in that moment, Adam did not, he he, uh, he did not uh, become cut off to the degree that Jesus was. In fact, it was grace because of Jesus that Adam was not separated to the degree To quote Kent Hughes, not even the most evil men of all of history, including Nero and Hitler, have ever known in this life the horror of being completely cut off from God. But Christ knew it. See, you and I have experienced varying degrees of of emotional grief or betrayal or loss of friendship. But this has no parallel in human consciousness. The eternal son who had perfect union with the father for all eternity. Perfect union. Just think of the best marriage. Two people perfectly knit together. Think of the best friendship, kindred spirits that are inseparable. Think of twins at birth who who think and feel each other's emotions. Think of the deepest love that a father could have for a son. The most intimate, the very best of all humanity is, is an insult to compare to the unity and the relationship of the Trinity. Emotion cannot express what the son experienced to be forsaken by his father on the cross. And of all the pain that his body felt, and all the scorn and shame that he endured from man, this was the cup that he begged to pass by. Abba, Father, is there any other way? For three hours did he plead in the garden that he might not experience three hours of forsaken darkness on the cross. But why was there not any other way? Because forsaking his son was the only way to accomplish redemption. Friends, see the cost and understand the gravity of sin. 
Do not think lightly of the holiness of God or the difficulty of forgiveness. Take the Bible seriously whenever it declares that sin must be punished. Sin is declaring ourselves to be God. That sin is an attack on God's very own character. Do you remember when David stole another man's wife and then had him murdered? And then in Psalm 51, he declares, against you and you only I have sinned. Talking to God. You say, why? Because first and foremost, every sin must be seen through this lens that God created me, that God gives me breath, and that all of my actions are either for or against him. That in order for Jesus to save us, he had to, to save us from drowning in the ocean of our sin, Jesus had to enter into the very water of our sin. Take the Bible seriously when Galatians 3.13 says that Jesus became a curse for us. Take the Bible seriously when Peter says in 1 Peter 2.24 that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Or again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin. On our behalf. Beloved, this means that in order for you and I to be forgiven, Jesus had to, in some spiritual way, become every act of disobedience that you have ever committed. That your sin was placed upon him. That he entered the water of your shame and guilt and separation and then the wrath of the Holy Father against every transgression had to be poured out, had to be punished upon his son. If you want to know what God really thinks of sin, understand that there was no other way to redeem you than to forsake his son. Further still, let us consider the sufficiency of his blood because it wasn't just my sin. Consider the sins of the world, all the lies, envy, cold blooded murders, hatred, jealousy and pride, that wave after wave did he drink, and his blood is sufficient to make even the vilest sinner clean. To any and all who would call upon him. From all the world, from all of history, his blood is sufficient. But consider further still what it was like for the Holy Son who knew no sin, who hates sin, to become a curse to become sin, to become forsaken. See, as darkness rolled over the noonday sun, and for three hours he drank the cursed cup of forsakenness, mind cannot comprehend. Emotion cannot express But let me describe for you the effect. Because whatever was endured for that three hours on the cross, the Bible says that my sin 
deservedly separates me from a personal relationship with God, away from his presence and from being near to him eternally. The Bible says separated for eternity. And this is what my sin deserves. And so whatever he endured in that forsaken moment undoes all of that for those who call upon his name. Completely removes the sting of death, the sting of separation, the curse of my sin. Removes it all, and instead I receive his righteousness. Whatever he endured in that moment is an eternity of righteousness and forgiveness for me. Such that Colossians 2.14 can say, all of my debts were nailed to the cross. Hallelujah is right. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What a good question. Why? Why? See, because we've pondered what it means to be forsaken, we've reminded ourselves that this was the Father's plan. We've looked theologically at the necessity of sin being punished. But why would the Father ask this of his Son? Jesus begged, is there any other way All things are possible for you. Is there any other way? And we can scarcely comprehend with our guardrails in place what the Son endured, what price both the Father and the Son paid. And Isaiah 53 verse 10 says that the father was pleased to crush the son. That is scandalous. Pleased to crush his son? Why? There is only one answer to why. When all the cost, when all the price, and when all the shame is considered... His love was greater still. And he willingly chose to give his son to the praise of his glorious grace that Jesus was forsaken so I will never be to the praise of his glorious grace that Jesus became a curse so that I can be chosen to the praise of his glorious grace, that Jesus became my sin so that I can become his righteousness, to the praise of his glorious grace. I wonder if we wouldn't sing for just a moment these words and lift our voices of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that was To underestimate the holiness of God 
is to minimize the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And to minimize the price that Jesus paid, one will never comprehend the love of God for you. And this love is the foundation for everything in the Christian life. Out of this love we walk. And so I plead with you, listen to me, O oh, weary soul, what more needs to be done to say to you that you are loved? That Jesus Christ has felt your pain and worse. And you may wrestle to understand why God allows some pains that you endure. But do not doubt God's capacity to feel compassion for your pain. And when nothing else makes sense, remember the cross. Remember this, Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? To see the cross rightly, to understand the love of God in the cross changes everything. Amen. That God, your Father, is for you. I will close with this story of the great hymn writer and Scottish pastor, George Matheson, who at only age 15 was told that he was losing what poor eyesight that he had left. Now, he was a great, brilliant student. Um, he continued forward in his studies. He enrolled early in the University of Glasgow and his determination led him to, to graduate from college at the age of 19. And then he pursued uh, graduate studies in Christian ministry. But as he did so, he became blind. His sisters came along beside him, learning Greek and Hebrew in order to help him with his studies. Now, now that's some siblings. That's what I'm talking about. And he pressed on faithfully. Now, while he was in, in university doing graduate studies, he met and he fell in love with a young lady who would prove to be the love of his life. <clears throat> but his spirits collapsed when his fiance could not handle being married to a blind man and broke off the engagement, returning the ring. Matheson would never marry and the pain of that rejection would never totally leave him. Years later, he had become a pastor, a well-beloved pastor in Scotland. And one day, his sister came announcing to him her engagement. He rejoiced with her. But in the quietness of the night, his own heartache came rushing back. It was on the eve of her wedding as he was wrestling deeply with his own personal emotions when suddenly the Holy Spirit of God lifted his head and thoughts came like waves of God's never-ending, unconditional, sacrificing of his very son, love for him. And out of that experience, he wrote his most famous hymn titled, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. <clears throat> let me read for you the first two lines. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in the dust life's glory dead, and from the ground where blossoms red, life that shall ever endless be. Will you pray with me?
Our Heavenly Father, this morning, we've done our absolute best to contemplate and to think about what your Son did for us on the cross. The cup that he did drink, the cup of forsakenness, so that we might be forgiven. Father, the cross declares that you are holy, that there is no God like you, that you dwell in unapproachable light, and we have no ability on our own to enter into your presence, that all have sinned and fall short of your glory. Father, the cross also declares that your love is greater still. It is greater. And that all who call upon it will find complete, complete forgiveness and atonement and righteousness granted unto us as a free gift of your grace. Father, if there's anyone here who has not called upon the name of Jesus and looked upon the cross, give them faith right now that they might cry out and find eternal life. And Father, those of us that have, we rejoice. We confess, we can barely, partially comprehend the magnificence of your love. But to understand the price that was paid even a little bit more is to more understand your love. And we declare we trust you. If you have loved us this way, this much, we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, now is a chance for us to respond. You must respond in faith. You've heard God's word. I pray that the spirit of God has moved and stirred in your life. You must respond. I can't tell you what that looks like. That is you doing business with God Almighty. But do it, right? Most of us will stand and sing in faith. You sing out of the depth of what the Spirit has stirred up in you. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you want to use these steps as an altar to just pour out your heart of gratitude or whatever, do not let this moment pass by. Now that we have spent 45 minutes contemplating the forsaking of the Son, you are commanded to respond in faith. Would you stand?